At the Johns Hopkins University, common features shared by miracle cures, faith healing, political and religious conversions, and psychotherapy are studied by research psychiatrist Jerome Frank. All forms of psychological healing that is trying to influence people through words share certain common healing features. Uh, I guess the first of those is a kind of relationship with a healer, a person who inspires confidence in the patient, builds a, makes him feel he can trust him, uh, uh, inspires the patient's hopes, it's a very important ingredient. And then there's always a healing setting of some kind, almost always, a shrine, let us say, or a doctor's office, or a clinic even. My feet were sort of cemented down to the floor. In action, frozen. There is a third that I guess they have in common, and that's the increase of patient's sense of mastery, of control over what's happening. See, the thing human beings can least stand is chaos. That's the most frightening experience there is. And anything that gives a pe people a sense that they're in control again is a very important boost to their morale. And mentioning that one brings up a, a common feature of all these procedures, and that is if they work at all, they do it through arousing the person emotionally. He feels things as a result, happy or sad or frightened or angry, mainly, I would say, relief. Sometimes anxiety, because you get into areas that make him more anxious, make him or her more anxious than before. Belief is really crucial to all the to healing process of any sort, because without the belief, the person does not participate in any sense, of, in any real way. They may go through the motions, they may listen politely, as many patients do, but nothing happens to them unless they really believe that this can, that this can help them. Sometimes it is the power of this belief that a treatment will work that results in the cure and not any special power of the supposed treatment itself. The scientific term for this phenomenon is the placebo effect. In medicine, a placebo is a substance such as a sugar pill that has no direct pharmacological effect but which can have a therapeutic effect on pain and sickness in people who believe it will work. History suggests that placebos have been responsible for much of the therapeutic success of treatments throughout the centuries. In ancient Egypt, patients were often treated with lizard's blood and crocodile dung. Later, physicians used leeches to suck the blood of patients or made their patients vomit or froze them or overheated them. Many of these patients died, but those who survived often swore by their treatment just think of how many more testimonials there might have been if these physicians had been content to use just sugar pills. Okay. Placebos can be so effective that virtually any credible, socially sanctioned treatment administered in an appropriate context can have a moderate success. Rays come out from your body, from that center. Even the mere believable suggestion that a treatment will work is sufficient to make about one-third of sick people feel better, according to recent studies. You can imagine, though, how the placebo effect complicates the job of a researcher. How do you know whether it's a specific treatment that's working or just the fact of being given any treatment? One solution is what's known as the double-blind procedure. You give some subjects the real treatment and others the placebo and don't tell them which is which. In fact, even the researcher or therapist giving out the treatment can't know, so the results won't be biased. Sometimes, of course, the problem isn't bias, but outright fraud. Every year, so-called miracle healers deceive thousands of sick people. These charlatans want to make money, not provide cures. Unexplained phenomena, especially if you don't look too closely, are the foundation of alleged psychic powers, miracle cures, UFOs, and all sorts of crackpot theories but they're also the professional magician's stock and trade. So for some tips on explaining the unexplainable, we turn to a man who always has something up his sleeve, the amazing Daryl Bem. I would like to present a demonstration of mind reading, not one in which I read someone else's mind, but one in which Lisa attempts to read my mind. I have here a set of cards. Mm -hmm. I have one of the cards in mind. You do not know which one that is. I want you to concentrate and then touch any particular card that appeals to you. This card. 
Okay, do you care to change your mind? No. You have selected the Jack of Diamonds. Believe it or not, you have read my mind and you have read my chest. <laughs> Can we conclude that a psychic event has taken place? What would a psychologist say? Let's ask Daryl Bem. In real life, I'm a psychologist, not an illusionist. And as any psychologist can tell you, the demonstration you've just seen is the worst way to do an experiment. Nevertheless, it enables me to mention some of the things that a psychologist would use to safeguard the hypothesis that's being tested. Let us suppose that psychologists did want to test the hypothesis that Lisa and I did have some kind of psychic communication. Before one could even entertain such a hypothesis, one would first have to rule out two other possibilities. The first one you rule out is that it was merely chance, that only chance was operating. We had six cards in this case. By pure coincidence, it could have been one out of six. Would that have convinced you? It wouldn't have convinced psychologists either. Let us suppose that the psychologists have now ruled out that the demonstration you saw was just due to chance. Again, we are not ready to conclude that what you have seen is something psychic, because there are many alternative possibilities. If this were to be done as an actual experiment, I would never be permitted to be in the same room with Lisa. These are called procedural controls, and that is the second thing that a psychologist always tries to do, rule out alternative hypotheses. Another safeguard that we didn't put into place was that I didn't tell you ahead of time what the hypothesis was. I told you that we had psychic communication, but I didn't tell you which card would constitute evidence for that psychic communication. Did you notice that it wasn't until she had turned over the Jack of Diamonds that I announced that that was the correct card and showed you my t-shirt. Perhaps it occurred to you that I have 52 t-shirts. Not actually, but I did something quite comparable. Suppose, for example, that she had not selected the Jack of Diamonds. Suppose instead that she had selected a different card, the Five of Clubs. Since she didn't know the plot line ahead of time, I simply would have said that's exactly the card I was thinking of the five of clubs. And so I would have been correct even if she had selected that one. Suppose she had selected a different card, the four of spades. In that case, I simply would have said, that's exactly the one I was thinking of. And so forth. And so in fact, there was never any possibility that chance was operating. I don't leave things to chance. But a psychologist who well designed an experiment would have ruled out all of these things. Here's where experimental research comes in. When a number of factors might be responsible for an observed effect, and we want to know which one deserves the credit, then we have to do an experiment. The essence of an experiment is systematic manipulation or variation of one or more factors while holding constant all the others that might be important. The effects of these manipulated events on some behavioral reaction are then assessed.